want their money. Mm -hmm. Evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a call to order of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, the time is now 6.08 p.m. First item on the agenda is approval of minutes dated. Oh, wait. Apologize. And attendance is Ms. Akisha Kashmir online, committee member. Committee member Albert Benahan also online. Chair Joseph Skalovic of the committee in person. And Mr. Robert Traber, board member in present. Who else is there? And Ms. Alicia Perrin is also online, the superintendent. Okay, first item over the, on the agenda is the approval of minutes dated February 28, 2023. Do I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. Does anybody find any material errors or omissions? No, sir. Nor do I. Hearing nothing else, uh, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 You. Motion carries, the minutes are approved. Okay, next up on the agenda is review and possible referral of the RFP for DEI training. Mr. Pyros, I believe you're going to take that away. Yes, uh, this is a referral from or a request from this committee to develop a draft RFP for DEI training diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we've we've done that. We've presented, we have um, we have a copy of it. I think it's part of the uh, committee's record, but I'll go through some of the, um, the goals and objectives of this, uh, of this RFP. Uh, basically, it's to, it's to um, replace some of the functions that were being performed by Dr. Gay. I think he performed these in, in, over the past couple of years, and that is the keynote address of, at convocation, student assemblies, parent education sessions, board development training and strategies, unconscious bias and cultural competency and proficiency for staff, Title IX training for, for certified staff, and that the consulting services would consist of the unconscious bias and inclusive hiring practices, organizational factors and impact on student success, communication strategies, strategic planning, and diversity, equity, and, and inclusion integration for admissions. Uh, there's some reporting requirements that are included in this RFP that include some reporting out by the consultant to both parents, board members, board meetings, and um, that that also includes uh, recorded data and uh, to be able to be recorded and presented. Uh, so that's all included in here. You might want to take a look at the makeup of your committee, which is selection committee. Oh, but, but let me back up. The, the term of the contract would be for one year with uh, four one-year option renewals. So you renew it every year. You, you, you look at it and um, see if it's worthy of, of renewing. Um, Record reflect, Mr. Benahan is now in person. There was a cost assigned to it, which is a range of dollar amount. I can believe it was. I think it was ten to fifty. It was ten to fifty thousand. Yeah, it was ten to fifty thousand. But in any event, they're required to provide us with uh, an hourly rate, cost cost requirement timesheet, and uh, the schedule of, of fees that will be. Um, Approved by the board, by 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 the, by the school district, hopefully by by the superintendent's office, and uh, basically the, the crux of the of the RFP. The dates obviously on this RFP are, are flexible. We can change those at any time. The um, 
the evaluation process. There's there's a, there's a number of, of, of folks here that that are being being assigned. You can change those if you if you, if you don't think that they're appropriate. Uh, that's on page 17. Yeah, that looks fine to me. You can see Mr. Benan. Great. Evaluation community, do you see it? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it looks look fine to me. And the version that you have, the, the V2, that has been reviewed by the city attorney's office. So it's, um, unless you have any changes that you'd like to see made to the, uh, to the, to the document, that would be the, the document that would be presented to the full board for approval, and then uh, that would be the document that would be uh, issued out for, for publication on BidSync. Any questions? Mr. Ben Ann? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Perry, how are you? Good, how are you? Good to see you again. We're back. <laughs> uh, this evaluation is going to be every year? So, th so the, the first year will be signed this year, and then every year it will be evaluated to see if there's a renewal. There's a renewal, I, I, I believe it's 90 days prior to the contract being um, uh, expiring, yeah. you'll, you'll re-up it again if you see that it's worthy or if, if you'd like to have it renewed. What's going to be the process if um, the first year, let's say something's wrong with somebody and then the second year, keep going the same issue. I will be, you just make the stop, let me make a whatever situation the first time or? or yeah, the, the, the operating agreement will, be specif will specify that every year there'll be a renewal period. So 30 days, 60 days, whatever you, you, you deem fit. Okay. You'll write them a letter and tell them you intend to renew it or you just intend not to renew it and, and, and terminate the contract. I think no more questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Casimir? No, everything's clear so far. No questions. Thank you. Mr. Chair? No, no questions. Thank you. I got one question. Um, it's a little unclear about how the MBE works. MBE is actually verified by our purchasing department. They verify that the credentials that are being provided by the contractor are legit, that they're registered in the state. They have to provide a certificate and they verify that. Right, and as far as, as, far as the score sheets, our score sheets, we have no points assigned. The, the purchasing department automatically assigns they the, automatically the extra assign. 10 points or whatever okay. to the, uh, yeah. Thank you. No further questions. Uh, anybody else got a miss, uh, Superintendent Perrin? No, I have no questions. I just asked that, Mr. Uh, Perez, could you just tell people what the MBE stands for, just in case they're not aware? Minority Business Enterprise. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so hearing no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to Submit this to full board for approval to be issued. A second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Pyrus. Thank you very much. Okay, next item on the agenda is discussion on equity and sports attendance protocols. I brought this item. We had a few basketball things coming out, events canceled and stuff like that. I just want to know what kind of, what, what, what's the process behind deciding whether something's canceled or not? What, what goes into that? There's been a lot of confusion in the community, and it seems to basically happen around basketball. Really, no other sports. Uh, I believe, Ms. Perrin, you can take that. Um, so, specifically, there was definitely lots of confusion um, this year around basketball and I what I d determined um, um, by engaging in conversations with the principals at the high schools um, through communications with the um, the athletic directors that there needed to be more continuity um, across the district about expectations and in regards to communication in the decision making process uh, what, um, what came um, 
an issue was that people were making independent decisions and there was not communication about those decisions um, and clarity made so that they were uniform decisions. So moving forward, what we've decided to do for next school year, uh, we are using a one athletic director for all of the high schools. This year, the model was they had uh, three athletic directors, one at each high school, which was an administrator who received a stipend to oversee the process. So there was no continuity uh, with the communications and expectations around that with um, the school-based decision-making as well as the district. Um, so to avoid that, one of the things that we're doing is we're instituting that piece so that there is one voice and expectations around communication for that, those pieces. And will, will there be any kind of like criteria that for them to follow? Like what's significant, what? I mean, so, so it's like clear across all, all sports. So I think that it, it's important to make sure that we, we know what's going on because I can't say that there's going to be one specific, you know, um, one size fits for all for all high schools. It really depends on what's going to be happening. Um, I think it's extremely um, important to have the clear communication. So if something does um, transpire at one of the schools that um, poses a, a safety concern, that we are aware of what's going on, and then a decision could be made as far as what's going to be done and communicated to the community. That was one of the major issues. So the communication piece will be delineated for the individual who's going to be in charge as far as expectations are concerned with that. When we um, get to the point where we start opening up for sports next year, what we'll do is we'll sit down and talk about the issues that we saw this year, because aside from we had the major issues in which you're referring to at the high school level, but there were also issues at the middle school level as far as different things happening. Um, so just clearly delineating what those procedures are for communication, that will be done um, at the district level um, with the new athletic director who's going to be overseeing that to make sure that it's done. Um, and everyone's on the same page. I think that was a huge issue. I spoke with Dr. Baldwin about that as well. Um, and she was in agreement that that's something that we needed to work um, towards. Um, so Ms. Siegel um, and I had the conversation and it was decided that we would move differently um, in school year 23-24. Right. Is there anything we could put in place where like the cancellation of a game is the basically the last option? Because I'm the last one to say this because I'm all about the academics. I really not a sports-minded person, but um, for some people, the academics is what, I mean, uh, sports is what keeps them in school and keeps them motivated. So but when you cancel, like, basically some championship games or whatever have you based on behavior of one and affecting the whole team, it seems like it might no, be a I bit... Matt, I do understand that, but that, that wasn't the case this year um, at all, but it is a last resort. Um, there is no question that there isn't. It is something that we're looking at. No one wants a game to be canceled because children have worked hard um, to to work in these championships and their parents are looking forward to seeing them as well as the community. So it's absolutely a last option. Um, and the, the reasons why the games were canceled this year were all because of safety concerns. It was not something that was done lightly um, and because of, lacks of lack of communication. So that's where the biggest issues came into play. But I absolutely agree um, that, you know, when we're delineating the process, that is a last resort because I don't want children to be disappointed, the families or the community. Mr. Benahan? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I have to say, Ms. Akisha, um, Ms. Perrin, sorry, um, thank you, because I know for when these situations happen, you right away, and I know you was uh, out of the state doing some conference, and you from far away, you make action to be sure things will be resolved. The bad thing was happening in the situation, and we talk about that, yeah, it was that the lack of communication. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. You know, parents sometimes in, in people in, in staff or, or police department went crazy. Oh, this is happening. What happened? Why, why we don't know this way? We don't know that. Because sometimes people want to be chief. Everybody want to be boss, but they don't resolve the situation the way it's supposed to be. And especially when the communication is not out for the parents, parents go wild, you know? Yeah. We are parents, and then and then that's that's what we want. But I know there was a result. I know it was a consequence. I know you really um um resolved the situation. I really appreciate that. Um, the only thing was I can say it was a little a lack of communication. That's why everybody was confused. But mm -hmm. if the students doing things, and I and I agree in that part that they doing things um they're not supposed to, they're gonna have consequence. 
I don't want the sport get canceled. I want the kids have huh, so much sport. And I always are favored to have sport in Bristol school. But if you don't behave the way it's supposed to be, that's why we got policy. That's why we got a protocol. So you have to, you know, be ready for the consequence. So I just want to say that for the record. Right. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fire. All right, and to piggyback on that, that's what I was really getting at is um, there, what is the policy or protocol to like cancel the game or to keep the students out? I know the, oh, I'm so out of sports that the, I know they got a governing board for the high school sports. I forget what the name of it is and that we apply for, but it seems, it seems like sometimes they'll still let the kids play there and we won't let them play here or vice versa. So really what, what the decision making process was um, in regards to this year was there was a huge safety concern at one of the games in New Haven um, earlier in the year where there was a massive um, fight with the students um, and parents. Um, police were involved um, and that took place um, over the weekend um, and the game took place and, and it was a huge issue. So what was determined after that game, we knew that they would probably meet up again had they reached the championships. So we had put into place that they would engage in restorative practice circles um, to see if the children would be able to engage in the process appropriately. Um, so, you know, there were um, circles held um, at the New Haven School as well as here um, with our Bridgeport School. And then they all came together to have this conversation about what was done that was wrong. Um, it was a very contentious situation where a lot of people could have really gotten hurt. Um, and we, what we was communicated was that they were all set, that everyone was in a good place, um, as well as staff being able to move forward. But what was not communicated was that there was a communication with um, a superintendent from a, the, another district that the game would be closed. That was not communicated to myself or any district personnel. So we were made aware of that at the last minute. And I didn't think that was fear for our community or for our parents because it was not communicated to us as well to be able to make that communication and make sure that you know we had communicated that so everyone was on the same page. Uh, when that did um, become, I became aware of that, one of the things I asked for was to have added security at the game instead, um, instead of closing it out since the not something our community was aware of. At that time, it was communicated that, you know, the other district would not participate in that because that was an agreement that was previously made. Um, so at that time, that's when we had determined that we were not going to be moving forward with the game because I was not going to um, not allow our parents or community community members in at that time without having communicated it appropriately. Um, so that's really where that one came from. For the most part, uh, when I have conversations, at, well, since I've been here, when I've had conversations uh, with principals about students or issues, it has been done on an individual basis. Um, one of the things that I think that uh, we've gotten away from is having, you know, this policy or expectations for our student athletes about what that looks like as far as grades, as far as behavior is concerned, as far as sportsmanship, which we have to get back to. And I think that's because there's different expectations at different schools, hence why I wanted to create one umbrella that everyone is going by um, and delineating what those expectations are to the athletic director who will be overseeing all the high school basketball and sports. Thank you, Ms. Casimir. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick comment. I mean, this, this stuff is hard, <clears throat> right? It's like you can never predict what is going to happen at any given event sports, you know, event, et cetera. Um, and I also just want <clears throat> to mention something that uh, Ms. Perrin had, um, you know, uh, touched on a little bit, is that when you're in another district and you're in another town um, and you're in another part of the state, you're kind of at the mercy, you know, of the superintendent of that, that, that city or the police department at that city. So, you know, just looking at it from a... Um, like a criminal justice perspective and a, you know, it all boils down to safety. Um, are, you know, is the person or the perpetrators uh, that are involved, um, you know, causing a safety issue for everybody that's at that venue or at that game, you know? So, you know, just looking at the same situation from different lenses is not an easy call to make, but safety should be the ultimate priority 
for mm-hmm. everybody involved, whether they're kids, spectators, parents, staff that are there. Um, you know, so so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Cosby. Mr. Mr. Trayvon, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I'm, I, I know I'm coming in on this sort of late and you've discussed it. Um, I, in my experience, many, many years ago, I played in games where we had tensions between two schools and they literally played the game in an empty gym with nobody there but the cheerleaders. Um, so I, the game, getting the game accomplished can be done. It's whether or not you can include, you know, pr- parents and other supporters uh, in a safe environment. And that, as Ms. Parent said, I would agree is paramount. Um, but if the issue is getting the game done for competition's sake, whether it's a playoff or whatever, you can do that in a neutral site. Mm-hmm. Um, if you really believe there's, and that's between, that would be between either the superintendents or the athletic directors of the respective schools, mm-hmm. I would think. And and you're absolutely right, Mr. Traper. And I and I that's that's exactly what was you know supposed to happen in in this specific case. However, it was never communicated to our community, which caused you know this this huge uproar about what's going on with our children. Why can't we see our children when it was never communicated? Um. So I absolutely agree with you that you know for the for the sake of competition, there are alternatives aside from canceling a game that you know that does have to be looked at when we're considering safety measures. Um, but what I think specifically Mrs. Sakalovic was re- speaking of was the fact that you know it was canceled and that was ultimately the choice because there was not that um communication ahead of time. So all, all parties would be aware of what was happening and the why it was happening. Yep. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, and a final note, this is not, well, maybe unless anybody else wants to speak, um, it's not per se about the basketball games, about this. It's about the feeling I came away from with the whole situation that our children are so feared that another city wouldn't come and play with them. How do we get to a place like this in the city? I, I know our students are hit by traumas of all sorts, and this is this is the inequity uh, is happening throughout the state. This is this is why I brought it here because it's like just a sense of like doom. I mean, you go down the road to Fairfield, Fairfield, Connecticut would never, never dream of banning parents from any kind of game. If there was a fight, if they were expecting trouble, they boost up the security personnel and control control access somehow to certain individuals. But it's just like this doesn't happen in other cities, and this is the iniquity I'm seeing. Not 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 the decisions for this one game or two games per se, but just an overall feeling of I don't know how to properly express myself, but I could feel that it's like really really unfair to our students because e- even if there's a say there's a fight in Fairfield or a fight in Bridgeport, you compare the two cities and they're like an Playoffs, you got people coming to these games, watching the kids play. They'll be watching the kids in Fairfield that had a funny play because they got big security there. But unfortunately, the Bridgeport game ended up canceled or closed to outsiders. And I, I don't know. It's just mm-hmm. and, and just school spirit and all that stuff also suffers as well. And it's just like it just it just seems very, very, very sad to me. I, I agree with you, Mr. Sokolovic. Um, but I think about it from the perspective of a student. When I was a student in Bridgeport Public Schools, it was similar. It was absolutely similar. We had the games that we play, and there would be tons of fights and things that would be happening. And it was always this expectation that this was going to happen in our urban center, that this is going to happen in, for these Bridgeport kids. How do we move differently to be able to let students know it's okay to be upset about something, it's okay to disagree without looking to become aggressive in the way they engage? And how do we change how people look at us? Because that's really what it's about. We're in a city of brown and black children who go to these schools that represent our city. I said, and when they talk about Richport, and you know, you're constantly hearing these things, you know, it gets embedded. 
And then the kids start, you know, showing behaviors that they shouldn't because they feel like this is what people expect from us. We have to work on changing that culture. It took a long time for us to get here and it's going to take an even longer time for us to move differently. But we have to make sure that our parents, our community members are all pushing into that and feeding into making sure that kids know that they're worth something. And that's really what it's about. It's looking at yourself saying, I, I said, no, I can't control what somebody else does, but I can control how I respond to it. So that way I can change the narrative. We have to work on changing the narrative. That's one of the things that I know this specific committee talked about, you know, with branding initiatives to try to change what that is. What does Bridgeport represent in the eyes of so many, specifically our children? Thank you. Mr. Yeah, I would add one other thing. Um, you know, my experience was 50 years ago in Los Angeles, um, public schools, and it was depending on the neighborhoods. But more recently here in Bridgeport, uh, when we started the soccer league in the late 90s here in Bridgeport, when we would go play in Trumbull or Monroe, there was a racist presumption about our kids. Um, and there was no problems at all, but we were loud and supportive. And, you know, they would just, it was a racist stereotype being applied. So we have this, this expectation of how we're going to behave when we were behaving in a perfectly acceptable manner, just not to them. And I remember the first time we took the 10-year-old girls out to play at Trumbull High School, we had more parental support than I'd ever seen at any one of these games in my life. They were loud and raucous, and people were like just intimidated by us. But we weren't doing anything wrong. We were just having fun. Um, and being supportive of our kids. So I think there, there's an element of what can we do with ourselves and our demeanor and our behavior. And then there's an element that we're dealing with that is beyond our control that we have to you know, constantly combat, which is how other people in other communities perceive us, correctly or incorrectly. And oftentimes it's incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So I think there is that element. I know when, I, when my daughter was at Central, we, she was on the fencing team, and we'd go out to these other communities, and my wife and I would find ourselves sitting in the stands next to some parents from North Bramford or somewhere, and they were all white. They assumed because we were white, we were with North Bramford, and they would say things that were inappropriate to us, <laughs> you know? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with you, Ms. Perry, 100%. People, they think because... Um, Bridgeport school or, or the past was, you know, terrible or worse or whatever. They think we're going to keep doing the same. We're going to keep doing the same. And I know we change a lot. As, as us the board members, you know, board education, they always think of home education it was, you know, always negative. But they see now the difference because I always say together we make the difference. You know, we work together. You know, nothing is perfect. We go up and down. But at least we try the best, you know, for Bridgeport school. We try to break that chain that, as you say, Ms. Perrin, you know, people, they think we're going to be the same. No, we have to change that. We have to work together, especially for our kids, because I, I really don't like when I go into the town, they say, I'm oh, coming from Bridgeport. The first thing people say, <clears throat> wow, Bridgeport? I say, yes, Bridgeport, I'm coming. I'm very far from Bridgeport. What's the problem? <laughs> What's the problem? You guys, how I am? How I am. So it's, it's, it's like a team working together. It's not going to be easy, but as I say, good communication, great successful, and together we can make the difference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anything else, anybody? I just wanted to say, I, you know, just based upon what Mr. Traber shared, as well as Mr. Benahan, I just think about, you know, those those racist connotations that are out there, right, um, that that live. And even like when we've gone to the debates, Mr. Benahan and I, people have come out, oh, your kids are so fabulous. They're great. And I almost want to say, well, what did you expect them to be? Because... <laughs> And they're here to be, you know, they're here for a purpose. Did you expect us to be anything but? And, you know, it's it's almost like an insult, like a slap in the face that you expect our children not to be well behaved, not to be articulate, not to be smart because they're from Bridgeport. And it, it's it's a reminder of the work that we have to do, not only within our community, but with our neighbors as well, to learn to accept people for who they are, who they show you that they are versus who you want to believe that they are. Absolutely. Yeah. And thus is the reason that this was on this committee, just to get all this conversation out there. Thank you very much. Anything else, anybody? 
Just to add something, Mr. Chair, thank you. One of the good things that we're doing is very important that at least us as a board member, Ms. Perrin, we appreciate what the staff and the students are doing. Not all the time, like I said, okay, thank you, you're doing a good job. But we need to show them, well, like we appreciate what they're doing to a Bridgeport school. They're very smart. What the um, our staff they're doing, you know, when you give it credit and you appreciate what they're doing, so they have more passion, they work more with the school, and they really appreciate that because we appreciate what they do. Because it's not it's not easy what that you know staff they're doing. But you know, and I'm very glad that you every month, Miss Perrin, you do the presentation, you know, to give a certificate, you know, for the staff and the students and people see that parents see that they say, oh my God, at least someone now they appreciate what the students and the staff is doing. So, you know, it's a good thing. Little by little in the beginning, we change things. As I said, together we can make the difference. No more comments, Mr. Jack. <laughs> Anybody else? Hey, hearing none, very good discussion. Thank you, everybody. And next item on agenda is presentation of three year disaggregated data student staff racial demographic comparisons with file on titles teacher vice principal principal all administrators above principal this is a continuation of the item that was last month with all the data side by side um we just want to disaggregate it a little bit further to see our administrators our forward face our forward facing administrators that our students see Yes. Good evening. So I sent over, um, we, you should, did you receive, there was a small chart broken down regarding the administrators. Yes. Um, and this is the, most of the data we have is only for this current school year. Specifically when we talk about the current uh, racial breakdown, uh, the ethnic breakdown for our students. So the last meeting we had, we did we did provide the pie graphs and other um, the overall for the teachers. But now when we look at the administrators, and I had to break it down a little because as I was doing math and looking at to give you percentages, I noticed that there was one group that I found a little confusing. So I was trying to clarify that. Um, the administrators above principal. Um, Jay Ulysses Rogers, who's the director of payroll and benefits, he helps create all this data for me. He's the whiz with Munis and Excel and everything. So I had to break it down. So when we look at all this, first and foremost, at this point, there are approximately 98 administrators um, with, the, with our Bridgeport Public Schools. Of that, Approximately 57% are Caucasian or white. 11% uh, identify as Latino or Hispanic. 30% identify as Black or African American. And out of the 98, we have one uh, administrator that identifies as Asian and one as American Indian or Alaska Native. So their percentage would be obviously extremely small, about 1% each. So breaking it down a little further, when we focus on the first level, which would be assistant principals and what we call as the deans, or as we like to, we also call them the 10 month administrators. There are approximately 38 of these 10 month administrators. Of those, <coughs> excuse me, 58% or 22 identify as white, 8% or three, identify as Hispanic and Latino, and 34% or 13 identify as Black or African American. Excuse me. My apologies, it's allergy season. Yeah. The next uh, group, that uh, Mr. Ulysses created was principals, uh, the special ed supervisors, the district supervisors, assistant directors, and pro program directors. Now, unfortunately, he didn't get back to me um, yet. I wanted clarification. 
if this meant the um, directors who are at City Hall, such as uh, the director of psychology, the director of speech and language pathology. But there are approximately 46 of these 12 month administrators, as we all call them. Uh, 57% identify as white, 13% identify as Hispanic and Latino, 26% identify as African American or black, 1% as Asian, and 1% as uh, um, American Indian or Alaskan Native. I went ahead and then I broke it down for starting from the superintendent, the deputy superintendent, the CAO, the executive directors, and then the directors or executive di department heads, such as the special ed department, the science department, performing and visual arts, speech and language, social workers, school psychologists and guidance counselors, I'm not, I'm sorry, school guidance counselors, the psychologists, SLPs, and our uh, language department. At this point, our early childhood uh, is vacant, so that is not in this number. But there are 13 who hold those titles. These are, some of them are under, as part of BCAS, but some of them are not affiliated with the union. And that would be the executive directors, the CAO, the superintendent, and the deputy superintendent. But of those 13 at the highest level, 38% identify as Black or African American. 31% identify as Latino or Hispanic. And 31% identify as white. When we look at the you, we mentioned on the last time our student population. The majority of our student population identify as Hispanic or Latino. There are approximately 58% of our student population identifies as Hispanic and Latino. There are approximately 9% identify as white. 29% identify as Black or African American. 2% identify as Asian, a half a percent identifies as American Indian or Alaskan Native, and 2% two or more races, and 0.1% of Native, Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander. So we, at the last meeting, we talked about how the majority of our, um, I'm sorry, our student population identifies as Latino and Hispanic. But that is actually that, um, when we count our teachers, the educators, the certified staff, and then the administrators, the Latino and Hispanic is the lower percentage in the, in, um, of our educators. The majority of our teachers or um, educators and then the administrative staff do identify as white or Caucasian. Secondly, um, the highest uh, group uh, identify as black or African-American. Third would be Latino or Hispanic. We have a few, a small percentage of Asian and a small percent, excuse me, percentage of Alaskan Native or American um, Indian. And then we do, there are a few that identified as either two or more races or they chose not to answer the question. So those are, that's the breakdown of the numbers. Does anyone have any questions about that part? Oh, let me check how many members first. Mr. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, now, Dr. Corbett, I have a question for you. When you say Hispanic and Latinos, what is the difference in the two words? There isn't. The reason why I, I specifically say Hispanic and Latino, that is the category listed on all the forms. Okay. 
No, I understand. You know, but I know the hard for it, and then I know it's this process that we <laughs> we working about the word Hispanic Latino because I as 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 panic, you know, and Hispanic Latino for us is the same words. You know, it's the same thing. Whoever is listening to you, they will say, "Why should you using two words in Hispanic Latino?" You know, the same thing. I know some form they say that, but you know. Right. I understand. You know, I just want to ask, you know. No, nope, that's fine. And same thing with Black African American. Again, these are the these are the categories or the choices that are on the forms yeah. that um, the government uses to track the uh, makeup of. No, no, I understand. The, it's like I want to say, right. you know, like, and then the poor you white race, you know, and then they want me one day they want me to call me white, and I said, no, I'm not white. <laughs> You know, so, you know, we'll go back and forth. <laughs> so and it's just something that had to be undone and stuff like that. But no, I just want to ask you that question. No more questions. Yeah, I, I just want to piggyback on that for a second because I've gotten myself into in trouble by using the words interchangeably. Not all Hispanics, Latinos believe as you do. Because I believe I might, I might get this wrong because I'm not a history buff and a geography buff, but I think... The Hispanics refers to more Spanish-speaking areas in Europe, like Portugal, Spain, or such like that. And the Latinos, the Latin America, I've like, got to educate over you shaking his head, so I don't know, maybe you can clean that up a little bit. Portugal. <laughs> Not Portugal. Yo, let's cut Portugal out Sorry. where they don't speak. <laughs> See, I told you I get myself into trouble. <laughs> they speak Portuguese, you're right. But but yeah, and I've got I've had people get offended by being by me calling them Hispanic when they're identified as Latino. So there is some disconnect in there where some people want to and we currently got some people who don't just wanna in the legislature, we got Latin Latinx coming up and they wanna block the very word Latinx because it's not in their language, but it's a more inclusive word that some people would like to use. So there's a whole bigger stuff there. <laughs> I, I go ahead, Miss Casimir. Miss Casimir, you got something to say? Uh, I was just uh, shaking my head in agreement. I mean, um, but you know, going back to what she said, these are federal standards. So it doesn't matter whether you're Latino or Hispanic. They're putting you under white, right? So like, and I think about mixed race. Okay, mixed race. I see the number for mixed race, but have you incorporated, you know, half of the white, per, you know, like somebody who's half white and half black, like, have we incorporated that into the white and the black section? And then what if, some, you know, and I'm just being ridiculous about this. What if somebody has a Russian uh, father and a mother from Barbados? That's two races. I'm just, you know, just hypothetically picking that out. Like, I think that it's just so you know, confusing, and it probably is by design. It's much bigger than that, us. I know it's a, at a federal level, but really when you think about it, they need to break a lot of this stuff down. So um, yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. You know, Miss Kashmir, to respond to you, I live that. I'm half Asian and my father was an Italian Jew. So what do I put down on the forms? I don't, I, I don't fall under any specific category. Technically, what's the trigger? Exactly. Yep. Two, two things. One, could you go back through the student percentages quickly for me? Sure. I, I saw the data from the previous meeting, but I didn't. Yep. Okay. Take notes. So, Hispanic and Latino? Hispanic and Latino make up approximately 58%. Yep. Uh, the Black or African American population makes none of some sorry 29 percent there's approximately two percent asian students nine percent white or caucasian students a half percent of american indian or alaskan native sorry how much percent you have half percent 2% uh, students identify as two or more races. And 0.1% identify as Native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander. And then I just, in the discussion we just had, I've been, I've read some articles recently about the debate between whether what we call Spanish speaking peoples 
Some prefer one thing, some prefer the others. We've seen a similar debate over the last few years within the uh, Native American populations. Uh, my favorite, I swear to God, I started in February of 2001. We had to do the census data that spring. I'd never done it before in my life. Nobody showed me how. I go through my class trying to figure out how to do it as tactfully as I can. And I then end up with my African-American students last and I'm counting. And I say, one, two, three, we're gonna have 13 African-American and a voice in the back of my room goes, I am not African-American. And I looked at her and I said, what are you? And she says, I am Jamaican-American. <laughs> I said, you are so right. And I would feel the same way, but I don't have that space on this forum. <laughs> so I think it's always gonna be difficult. We wanna be sensitive. I notice we have the um, category here of uh, American Indian that we have on this thing which we're trying to avoid. Yes, American. Which is the government's name, right. I have recognized. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a minefield. Yeah, I, I see I see on this we're doing, seems like we're doing the best in the top administrative levels as far as diversified, diversity meeting. You see, and I, I believe you said, um, African American number was what percent in the top level? Thirty-eight percent. Thirty-eight percent, which which actually exceeds our African American students, staff, and other numbers as well. The Hispanics is up there as well at 30, 30, 31 percent. Thirty-one percent, which is more than close to twenty twenty something percent higher, twenty points higher than um, on a teaching level. Correct? Is that about right? I believe. Correct. The percentage of uh, Hispanic teachers or B BEA members is about 11, 12 percent. Students again, 50 plus percent. About 59 percent. Right. So, so as, as we go down through the staff, our pipeline is getting smaller and smaller. Yes. So the teacher will become an assistant principal or will become a principal. Likely scale their way all the way to the top in time, in in the best in the best world, in the best world up. People will come up from the bottom. So um, we have a couple of recruitment events are coming up. What have we have we done anything differently to recruit in for minority pools than we've been doing? Yes. We, you know, what we we have been trying to do is uh, we've been using our social media a lot more and we do uh, we used Bridgeport Board of Ed social media. So we've been posting Parent Square, um, I believe, uh, the Instagram account. Um, I know I created a Bridgeport Public Schools LinkedIn account that has the um, job fair advertisement for the job fairs. If uh, any of you have seen, we have billboards now up advertising the um, job fair. So I thank uh, Superintendent Perrin for granting us this uh, budget to do the uh, run the billboard. So I was really excited to get those up. We are actually also looking into possibly purchasing um, reusable lawn signs and to use those on perhaps putting them on all the school properties to advertise job events, uh, job fairs coming up as well as if there's any staff members, community members who want to put them up on their yards. Uh, since some of us don't, may not live in Bridgeport, we can bring it to our yards in our communities and hopefully um, recruit uh, beyond just Bridgeport. But one of the big things that we've been focusing on recently to increase the um, diversity in our staff is focusing on um, our resources at our fingertips. We started last year a para to, oh, well, it started for this year, a para to teacher fellowship for SPED. And we were able to pull, I believe there are four, three or four members. I think I know three off the top of my head and they are all people of color. Um, so it is, it, it's great opportunity. Um, we are also, when we do the uh, job fairs, we started 
inviting um, last year we had invited local universities and other um, agencies to help come and direct people who want to become teachers. So there are a lot of people who don't know how they could become teachers. There are paras, clericals. So if they come, we could say, okay, you have this, then let's go direct you to talk to this person. So we're definitely trying to tap into the community. Uh, we try to get word of mouth that, hey, if you know someone who's interested in being a paraprofessional or you know a para who wants to become a teacher, then come talk to us. Uh, my um, Michael Brosnan and Steve Correa at my office are, and Sharon Pivrado are doing great with trying to direct people in, in steps they could take to become teachers or paras or things like that. We are working on a uh, fellowship uh, or a partnership to help people become uh, paras. And then from the paras, they could eventually become teachers. So we're trying to tap into all of that uh, smarter partner, I like to call it smarter or more useful partnerships where the, the schools that are more um, known to produce uh, a more diverse um, student teaching population. So we focus on that and try to recruit um, through them and focus on our partnerships with them again to increase the diversity in the staff. So we, and we're open for any ideas. Yeah, um, another question I always have to ask, what are some of the problems with recruiting teachers to the city of Bridgeport? I won't even say the usual, but beyond the finances, the teaching population is unfortunate. That well is drying up. Less and less people are going into teaching. Teaching no longer has that allure or that pull for a lot of, if you think about it, in a few years ago, the majority were um, white or Caucasian women who went into teaching. Even that group is less and less in the well. So it's not only are we competing with a shortage or lack of finances, there aren't candidates. And with the state policies or state guidelines requiring a more diversified teach um, workforce, other districts are not only offering higher salaries, but they are actually poaching from our districts with um, prettier incentives. So, you know, we try to be creative. Um, I always like to try to say that, you know, even though we are the biggest district, we do function like a small district in that everyone pitches in when we need to. And that, I think, is a nice thing to have in a workforce, especially as a new teacher is, you know, I, I try to in, uh, encourage or or instill a sense of community and teamwork in that we, I may not be able to offer you the big funds or things like that, but you know we can offer you the support and hopefully as we try to do um, professional development, focus more on what is um, important or what teachers actually want, then we can offset the lack of funds. Thank you. I did, but I, no, Levi, I wait for you. Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the um, listen, I, there are, I mean, there are, there are clear, I remember one year at Blackmore, we lost three teachers to Stratford. They were five to 10 year veterans. They were women with young children and they got an $11,000 raise to go to Franklin school in Stratford. Um, it's, it's just, it's hard. Um, you know, they, they cut their teeth in Bridgeport. It was that way when I started teaching and Miss Perrin, when you started, um, you know, they, they were, you know, people knew that teachers cut their teeth here. They got their experience in the classroom. And after five years or so, they started looking elsewhere. And I know the last year I taught one out of the four teachers in my cluster moved on to Newtown. Um, and the other one would have moved, but she was too old. So I, I just it's a holding on to them is hard. Um, right. I've always you know, Mr. Sokolovic and I have talked about this. I know you all are doing something about it, but when I, the last year I was teaching, we had between 100 and 150 paras with bachelor's degrees. And, you know, 95 plus percent of those people were born and raised in Bridgeport. 
know the neighborhoods and mm-hmm. mostly people of color. So, but there had been there have been several programs since the '90s that help parents become teachers. But at the time we ran one, and in the middle of it, the state pulled the rug out from under. It was just Bridgeport and Hartford at the time. So we need more programs like that because that's a pool of people who it's a big race to become a teacher. <laughs> you become a para and you go to becoming a Bridgeport teacher. Well, that's you've made it big um, versus trying to get people in here who are are, are not going to be making any huge increase. Um, so I think that's the place to go. I, I'm happy to read there is some legislation being considered right now in Hartford that would make student teaching a paid job um, that would pay the student teachers. Um, you know, I, I believe that if we can do something as a as a board, uh, I, when I was with the union, as the union, I was arguing this to give scholarships to parents who want to become teachers that would get it. You know, that five thousand dollars that they need to pay the bills while they're student teaching is a huge obstacle to overcome. So I just think that if we can do things like that, we'll find, you know, the opportunity and we'll find the people who are interested in becoming a teachers. I will say we do we do offer financial um, incentives. We cover approximately ten thousand dollars for the cost for a para to teacher program. In the and while they're in this program, traditionally they teach it, they are hired and work as a para and receive a salary. Second year of the program, they are um, they're working as teachers under a DSAP. And then the third year of the program, they're hired. They sh- hopefully they're, you know, they're still D- working under a DSAP. So that is something we we are doing, and we have been, um, and a, a few others. Uh, one of the other programs we have is the um, for cross endorsements for uh, special ed, mm-hmm. and we are offset the cost for part of that pro that program as well. And obviously, in return, they do sign a promissory promissory agreement that they will remain working for us. It's usually three years. Yep. Yeah. I'm okay. Anything? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a very quick question: Do we uh, do we know if there are any high school seniors that are interested in? para positions or would they not be eligible because they don't have the experience? I, you know, I know that's a two-part question, but have we ever looked into just getting the data on like how many high school seniors show interest in, in you know, teaching or becoming, you know, uh, an employee of the board of ed? I can speak to, um, Carly Rokarez, the um, director of social work, she would she might have that information um, as to if there are any seniors who have indicated an interest in becoming a para or teachers. Now, for a para, either you need an associate's degree or you need to have passed the para pro exam. Unless it's the early, the little children, the early childhood paraprofessionals, there's an additional requirement there. So Yes, someone without an associate's degree, if a, someone could apply as long as they take and successfully pass the para pro exam. Yeah, because that would be really great information to pass along to, you know, high school seniors. I, I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, just solutions. That's all. So um, to answer, to, to talk about that second piece, Ms. Castromir, um, that's something that we have talked about um, with Carly um, and looking at using the Zello information, which is um, the warehouse per se, that um, students in grades six to 12 use to talk about goal setting um, is where we're really looking to try to get some of that information from, whether it's regards to working in Bridgeport Public Schools or what type of pathways they wanna go on so that we can better create better opportunities for them as they exit um, secondary education. Yeah, yeah. So that thank you very much. That clears it up. And and I would love to, you know, at some point, you know, to get just the interest, you know, just to see what the interest is. That's all. At some point in the, in future meetings. High school kids are now working. 
I just want to make sure I understood this. Wasn't there a report I heard recently about a new effort to get high school kids to to help tutor? They're they're helping tutor younger kids in one of the schools in that school. It, it could be. I can't tell you that I know that off the top of my head. But where did I hear that? I could have sworn it was within the context of Bridgeport. Um, I know we used to at Blackham get middle school kids to come over and help tutor, but I also thought I more recently heard a report about a program with high school kids helping to tutor younger kids. Well, and to me, that's a, like a you know that's a, 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 a beginning of trying to inspire them to become teachers and to I think about teaching. I don't know about the tutoring piece. Like I said, I don't want to speak incorrectly because I don't know that. I know that there is a high mentoring. School, um, there's a high school program um, called Elevate where there is a I know Elevate. Yep. Um, there's a component where high school students do go, and it's called Little Elevate, where they go to a partnering school once per yeah. week and do some work with the students. And most of that is in regards to like social emotional pieces, nothing academic, something yeah. that looks that, but I'm not sure of anything outside of that. No, I think that's what it was because I follow Eric, you know, again, another black alum. I follow Eric and his work with Elevate. Yes, I think that's what it was. Thank you. Anybody have anything else to add? Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at this point, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. A move. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Gary's. Thank you, Mendes. Have a good night, everybody. Welcome back, Ms. Perry. Let's relax. Yeah. <laughs>